Thank you, um, Eric, Mark, Lee. Uh, this has been a great conference. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, more importantly, thank you for the support towards Pisces. Um, and so when I got the invitation, I was uh, excited, but nervous and anxious at the same time. Uh, I wanted to drink some wine to celebrate, but I also want to relax, so I end up in, uh, in this situation here. Um, and you know, it's intimidating to come here as a younger faculty. Certainly, uh, we've seen uh, the best displayed in front of us um, here. And uh, it's, it's a global title. Um, so, <laughs> and then where's my point? Okay, great. And then, so here's me um, trying to contribute here, um, <laughs> shying away. Uh, but I'm going to try to overcome that with a lot of enthusiasm for you. Uh, Drake is pretty hot right now. If uh, you've been watching closely, we'll see more of that uh, this weekend. Uh, so, so let's go. Um, so who gets a, who gets a stent? So what are my goals? So my first goal is going to be who gets a stent. We're going to do a technical walkthrough. What could and will eventually go wrong and go over some cases. Um, so if you look at the pediatric guidelines, uh, the main requirement is that you can get this stent to adult size, uh, the exception being the uh, high-risk neonates, the, the sick infants who have uh, some degree of LV dysfunction typically. Uh, but everyone else, uh, you're looking at the peak-to-peak -peak gradient. Uh, you are also considering uh, systemic hypertension. They're on medicines, your LVDP in the presence of uh, collaterals. Uh, similarly, in the adult uh, guidelines, you're mainly looking at the gradient, the presence of uh, collaterals, and then you're working towards your, your way towards intervention. And so here, um, with the exception of long segment lesions, hypoplasia of the transverse arch following recorrectation, uh, most of these consultations are going to be coming to, to you guys. So what are we going to do about it? So it all, it all comes down to anatomy. So the red is um, stop, let's go to cath lab, not surgery. You know, orange is let's see, uh, green, is, um, green is go to surgery. Um, but this is an evolution uh, based on your anatomy and based on your, your experience, based on your surgeon's experience. Um, and certainly, the, you, know, you really have to become very technologically sound at the discrete uh, lesions uh, that are in or around the brachycephalic uh, vessels before you kind of escalate your game to kind of going up to uh, the more complex lesions. So, um, you know, what also should be here is kind of, I'm sorry, what also should be here is uh, resistant lesions. And so either, you know, with, if it's long segments, uh, if it's tortuous and complex, if the lesions are resistant, uh, you're, you should be thinking about stent and surgical consultation. Certainly if there's significant hypoplasia of the transverse arch, uh, uh, they're likely going to surgery. And then we've been able to manage atresia of the aortic arch. Um, but um, everything warrants uh, a conversation between you and your, and your team. And if the surgeon's like, I don't want to touch that, and you feel like it's out of your experience, this is when you're going to be talking to your mentors, talking to your peers. You're going to be getting all the imaging you can get. You're going to be prepping the case like crazy, and you're going to try to stay within yourself. Um, and this is kind of what we've been handling over, since 2011. So as you can see, most of the adolescents and, and the adults, we've been managing uh, these lesions in the cath lab. So we're going to do a technical walkthrough here. And so, fortunately, I don't have to spend a lot of time with this uh, uh, after that great talk. So we'll do a measurement. You know, not all uh, vessels can be per-closed, so we'll make sure that it's at least five millimeters uh, before we attempt uh, pre-closure. Um, and you know, we had I kind of went through my pre-test questions for the sake of time, but uh, if you uh, this was also in Lee's talk. So the first the artery above the uh, inguinal ligament is going to be the inferior epigastric artery. So if you're seeing that as part of your access location, you know you're too high. Uh, so start your, you're start your case with hemodynamics. Um, do I miss a slide? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, you're looking at your peak-to-peak -peak gradient, usually with some uh, catheter um, uh, sheath mismatch to get a simultaneous gradient. If there's more than one lesion, you just slow pull back over a wire. Uh, you're going to look at your cardiac index and your LVDP because that's going to factor in your decision, particularly if your uh, peak gradient is less than 20. Uh, you're going to look for the presence of collaterals on your angiography, and then also look at the patient as a whole. Uh, consider other disease-associated lesions, such as renal artery stenosis and Williams syndrome, and take that picture below the diaphragm. So here we have a nine-year-old uh, who's 30 kilograms, uh, bicuspid valve, coarctation of the aorta, status post, and anastomosis with recorrectation. And so this is my scalp picture. Uh, we have you do straight AP, I'm sorry, straight lateral. And then the other angle, you just really want to get the ascending aorta out of the way in case you do fill it. So you want to move that aside and give, give yourself caudal angulation to kind of look up at the lesion. And so here we see a discrete lesion um, right at the level of the left subclavian. You see the accessory vertebral artery here. 
And since we're 30 kilos, uh, we're going to be able to put a, a stent in through this grind that's going to go to adult size, likely going to need redilation once they're adult size. Uh, so that's the plan. Uh, basic chemos, really we have an indication with a 25 millimeter uh, localized discrete, uh, the gradient localized to the discrete recorrectation site. Also, you see significant collaterals. I failed to mention that. So after, uh, you know, you're going to get, you're going to secure your wire position in the, in the right subclavian, uh, access that usually with a multi-purpose. Uh, usually, amplats are super stiff. If you're way out there, you don't necessarily need a bend. It's going to be a nice straight course for you. Uh, and then we're taking an additional picture with the, uh, the sheath that we're going to use for the interventions. In this case, it's the nine French, nine French flexor sheath. Uh, in doing so, you can really, truly establish your landmarks of where you're going to land your stent. Um, and, you know, I was taught early on, if, if you have all the, the room in the world to place a stent, like an SVC or a Fontan, really choose landmarks and, and just nail that location, that stent perfectly, exactly where you want it. Because you're not always going to have that luxury uh, with other lesions where there's going to be no room for air. So practice uh, putting the stent exactly where you want it with all your lesions. And so in this case, we were going to try to aim, aim it, um, not try not to jail the vertebral artery, but definitely we're going to have to jail that uh, subclavian. So how are we choosing your balloon stent uh, diameter? So our selection rules uh, um, would be that your, your diameter is going to be equal to the adjacent to the uh, normal aorta and no more than 150% of the adjacent normal aorta. And no more than three times the narrowest portion with the exception of native coarc with a posterior shell for atresia of the aortic arch. And length, you know, you, you probably want to put in the least amount of hardware, which will cover the lesion, but also provide enough stability to prevent embolization. And so um, at least 50 Usually in adults or adolescents, at least 15 millimeters distal to the obstruction, uh, but it all depends on the anatomy, and you really want to be confident, uh, particularly if it's a uh, torturous lesion or a mild coric, that you have enough hardware opposed to the, uh, to the vessel so it's going to stay. So here's, here's my first hot tip. It's in, it's in small font um, because it's, it's a little taboo. And I'm not talking about pre-dilation here. So this is, don't be afraid to balloon size. But we're, we're no longer doing pre-dilation of these lesions. It's leading to further aortic wall injury. But if you find yourself in a situation where the arch is very complex, perhaps there's a fold, um, perhaps there's you know, hypoplasia of the transverse arch, um, it's, it, in my opinion, I've, I've learned a lot by putting you know, very uh, co compliant balloons that I'm not resolving waste in uh, just to see how it behaves. Uh, but once you get more, once I've gotten more experience, I've shied away from that. Now, now which stent? So this is, this is, uh, there's a lot of questions um, before, and there's a lot of different clinical scenarios, so we can't go through all of them. So, but in general, here's, here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about uh, the clinical status of the patient. I'm thinking about the size of the patient, aka the size of the femoral, uh, the vessels, or where you're going to be, you know, going through to put the stent in. Uh, really, the geometry of the landing zones. You, again, you need a, a stronger stent, like a palmaz or something with more curve, uh, like a Genesis XD, uh, or more of a hybrid stent. Are you close to brachiocephalic vessels that you can't uh, uh, close off with a covered stent, um, so you have to use an open cell stent? Is the lesion more complex? Is it resistant? Is it a tight lesion? Uh, or is there going to be presence or increased risk of aneurysm <laughs> formation, such as a patient with a syndrome or an older patient? So a lot to think about. Um, now, in a pediatric lab, if you're thinking about what uh, can be dilated up to adult size, it's usually thinking about a length of at least 20 millimeters. Um, um, in, in general, you pretty much can put in uh, these stents if they're above 25 kilograms. There's other unique situations where you can get cute and you can get adult size stents in through smaller vessels. Um, but what we're stocking are the Palmaz series, uh, the covered CPs, Genesis XD, Intrastent. And then these pre mounted stents, uh, you know, only in, in the case of emergency. So Palmaz Blue, uh, the Genesis, and the coronaries. Um, you know, they can't get to adult size, so you're going to be stuck with a situation of trying to fracture them later on in life or having them surgically removed. Um, however, the, the Vallejo and the formulas uh, maybe uh, can get up there, depending on the patient. So going back to our, our patient, you know, we measured 10.2 millimeters in transverse arch. Uh, the lesion measured 5.7 millimeters, and at the diaphragm, we're out 10.5. So I chose a 25 millimeter Genesis XD on a 10 millimeter cordis PowerFlex. Uh, through a nine French flexor sheath. We like these balloons, there's very, no sh there's very little shoulder on it, uh, and so we like these. And so, um, we, another hot tip is just be mentally prepared for the worst case scenario every time, no matter what you're doing. You know, I, I, I put things on the loading dock, which is this 
area right here, it's off the shelf. And so I'm thinking about, um, you know, if I, if I do cause significant injury, what my, my backup plan is gonna be, and it's right there, and I don't have to think about it on the fly, um, because you may be in a situation where you don't have a lot of time to think about it, so look, get all that stuff out of the way and get it available, um, and so you're ready to go. All right, so what we've done here, we had the, the sheath distal to the lesion, and so we brought the, uh, we mounted the stent on the balloon and we brought it out. Then we kind of unsheathed about half of it, and then we did a distal flare. So this is different than the, the balloon and balloon, uh, um, obviously. So, um, and here you, you take a picture. You can see them a little bit, a little bit distal, okay, uh, from my landing zone. So now we're going to pull it back, unsheath everything, take another picture, take your time, make your small adjustments. Uh, look at your, I mean, the ribs are great, particularly in this situation. Um, I see that. The rim lines up that lesion nicely, so um, you can center it on your landmarks. And then you're gonna take your time. We don't do, we ha I haven't felt the need to do pacing. Does anyone do pacing when they put up core extents? Yeah, I think imagine it, I'm sorry? In the arch. In the arch. Like the transverse arch you're saying? Yeah. yeah. Um. But you get yourself in a situation where you could go up slowly and controlled and make those small adjustments as the stent's uh, uh, being inflated. And this is a key part. So as the balloon's coming down, you want to advance your sheath um, on biplane. You can make sure that you're uh, within the stent uh, uh, in, in each AP and, and lateral so you can get the sheath within the stent safely. That's why you can, if you need to put another stent up quickly or if you need to put a balloon in, uh, you don't have to worry about trying to get around uh, that distal uh, edges of the stent. And that's what we did. There was a little bit of waste here, so we redilated to 10. Uh, you can see there's less collateral flow after opening up the lesions. And then we're going to open up the, the side of the, the subclavian. So coronary wire, coronary balloon about the size of the subclavian. Um, and then this is the final result. Now, if you had to, in certain situations, you might have to do some proximal flaring and so um, to oppose the edges uh, to the aorta. And so Nicola Maschietto from one of my colleagues came and he, what he likes to do, he likes to move the, uh, the uh, wire to now the ascending aorta and then uh, put up a sizing balloon, like a 20, 25, 30, depending on uh, you know, the contour of the arch. And it just it flares it really nicely and it doesn't uh, move the stent. Um, and uh, it's a nice trick. Can I yep. Say that again, I'm sorry? Do you always solder your uses of five branches or only if there's a problem with the rest? Yeah, we always do. Always yeah, what do you mean by, what would you define compromise as? Green. Green. Well, 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 you had good flow on your post. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if, if I don't feel there's risk of deforming the stent that I just placed and it's a small balloon, yeah, sure, I think it can only help. And I mean, if you're measuring a grain, you're always, you're, you've crossed it and you have a catheter there anyway. Um, an XD will fracture at seven millimeters typically. Here we didn't need a seven millimeter balloon. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the left subclavian is obviously very forgiving. I mean, you know, you know, you can, you can, in fact, you can cover it. You know, you know. So, um, but yeah, I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Good to know. So Forbes looked at uh, over 500 patients from 89 to 2005, uh, and you, there were two deaths, and there was 4% uh, aortic wall complica complications and 10% technical complications, some of that related to the error effect of the older equipment and techniques. And on follow-up, uh, we had 3% dissections, 8% aneurysmation, and 10% uh, stent restenosis. We found the risk factors for aortic wall complication were uh, performing pre stent balloon angioplasty, location of the correctation in the abdominal order versus the isthmus or transverse arch, and uh, older age. And also expanding lesions above three and a uh, half times their, um, the narrowest margin. So, uh, so just to take a sense of the audience, so let's call this a 20 year old with a, a, a native lesion. Uh, who would, who would uh, stent this with a bare metal stent? 20 year old. 20 year old. Okay. Who? With a bare metal stent. No. <laughs> what about a covered stent? Does that mean you're pro-covered? Okay. So for the people that raise their hand for, okay. What if, for the people who said uh, bare metal stent, 
How about if it was a 50 year old? For sure, no. For sure, no. So this was placed, a bare metal sin was placed here. This in fact was a 20 year old patient. Older patient, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more action going on. This is a recorrectation, but focal discrete. And here, and here a covered stent was placed. No, did you think what it was? We can investigate. No. So just to um, switch gears just a little bit, so here's a neonate who had an arch repair who has recorrectation. So here you're going to try to avoid playing, uh, putting, placing hardware. You're going to try balloon angioplasty first. Um, following, um, you know, this was a little bit of a longer lesion. Um, that's a little bit of a tighter waist than, uh, than we'd like, but uh, not terrible. Uh, and then afterwards, you're really going to evaluate for the caliber of the vessel. You want to see that change. You're probably going to see a therapeutic tear, and that's, and that's good. But if there's a residual obstruction or there was a significant increase in caliber, or in this case, there's kind of a more of a longer segment uh, confined lesion, then I, I would advocate for protecting this with a stent. And here you're stuck with uh, your bare metal, I'm sorry, your pre-mounted stent, which you'll have to deal with later. That was a sub four, a six sub four. So single ventricle arch obstruction, um, you, know, you could argue, you know, it's a challenging decision of when to intervene. Um, you know, any gradient in the setting of could be important with single ventricle. So here we'll think about uh, ventricular dysfunction, AV valve regurge, and dislocal pressure gradient. Um, but here you really want to take advantage of being able to go antegrade uh, if they have not yet been a Fontan. So this is this was a patient who um, had who was a single ventricle SANO who they did not want to go back to the OR to uh, manage this arch obstruction. It was a gradient of 25. Um, it looked like it was just an area that wasn't, there was some residual tissue that wasn't uh, taken care of with the surgery. Uh, balloon was tried first with no change. And so here we are, you're gonna cross integrate with your wedge catheter, switch up for a stiffer wire, and then we're gonna be able to get a XD, uh, Genesis XD here, a stent that can go up to adult size. Uh, in good position. Uh, take advantage of having that second access from below uh, uh, for, to guide your interventions for sure. So how are we managing the atretic aortic arch now? You may have seen this at, at conferences. So the key is kind of, uh, you know, having a target. Uh, in this case, uh, this pigtail, uh, can anyone tell me what this pigtail is? It starts in the vein. Vein, SVC, anominant, leave way for cardinal vein, into the LA, into the LV. So we take some left ventricular grams and you can uh, get a target. If you didn't have this opportunity, you can uh, get another access from below so you have a nice target. And then you can use whatever technique that you use to, to puncture through that. Here, uh, we've used um, the back end of an 014 stabilizer which will eventually start running here, uh, over here. And so once that pokes through, then you can uh, dilate. And some, most probably at this point, would uh, just dilate enough so you can get your covered stent delivery uh, in there. Before covered stents, we were using um, bare metal, and our approach was to... Uh, you Oh, no, no, that would be safer. Yeah, to have a clear target more than just angiography. Yes, you can have a snare from above, but yeah. I think we were, we were comfortable with the size of the target that we went through with just the uh, wire. Um, so if, uh, with the bare metal, we would go up to 50 to 2 thirds percent of the, of the surrounding um, uh, caliber of the vessel, and then we'd bring back in six months of post-dilate, and this was the final result. You mean a covered stent? I I probably do with a covered stent. Um, what about everyone in the room? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, beware of resistant lesions, and they don't come up that often. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience, and this was not my case. But you can see the the shape of the stent when it went in ten years before, um, and you know after dilation with this is before. 
we had we had covered stents on the shelf, but as part of the Coast trial, and so uh, dilation was performed. There was a clear tear in the in the aorta, and the covered stent was placed to seal it. But beware of long segment resistant lesions. So I just want to highlight just the covered stents in general. Just B, it's not an ICAST atrium stent, so the EPTFE doesn't wrap around uh, the, the hardware, so it stops. You have to know, you know when this is going up, at what point, uh, you know, the, um, how far the covering goes to the distal stent, and you can't see this uh, on fluoro. So, uh, you know, when you're placing them in small kids and you're redilating that, uh, you have to take that consideration, whether or not there could be any foreshortening of that EPTFE covering and what uh, particular areas of your aortic wall is vulnerable as you're deploying these stents. Um, so this is a 56-year-old with a native coarctation. The gradient was uh, 30. Here's a case of just really understanding uh, your anatomy and uh, not getting cute. So I think uh, they were trying to get cute here with uh, probably a short, too short of a stent with too short, small of a balloon. And when this went up, uh, it just it essentially got a milked out and um, it was malpositioned here. And so what was, uh, so whatever you have to do in terms of your, if you're using angiography or rotation angiography or CT scan, um, just go through all your checklists to understand the anatomy of your landing zone. In a, in a high peaking uh, narrowing like this, you're gonna need a longer stent to kind of balance it. So here a longer stent on a bigger balloon was placed uh, and it was post dilated. And then had to take care of this other stent. So this uh, was captured uh, uh, with a balloon that essentially you just want a balloon that's going to be able to grab the stent but not dilate it. And then the plan, uh, this stent could not go up to the diameter of, this is an XD stent, so it can go to like 18, and that surrounding geometry was not was more than 18, so it had to be pulled down. And it was pulled down initially down to the level of the, of the renals, and then it was moved back up here in the center, and then redilated to kind of shorten it, um, and ultimately landed in between the celiac and the SMA. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll keep going. Uh, so here is a 19-year-old cork who had repair with recorrectation and a 30 millimeter mercury gradient. And I show this example for a specific reason. So initially, a balloon dilation was performed, um, leading to a confined tear you see here. And again, cover stents weren't available, uh, were, there, were on the shelf, but as part of the trial. Um, and so, but a bare metal stent was chosen, it was placed, and looks like we are good to go, right? It looks completely covered. But I think the point here is if you're in trouble and you think you caused a vessel injury, uh, pictures are your friends. You really want to localize and understand the injury so you know what you're uh, treating. And so you have to be sure when you see an injury once that it's completely resolved. And so what happened was change the camera angles, localize that the injury was still present, and then in fact could um, further localize it with a, with a catheter. Um, and they know exactly where you can land your covered stent. And so, I'm finishing up here. Uh, so there's two things wrong with this picture. Great, exactly, exactly. So biggest mistake, if you're suspecting uh, a vascular injury, you wanna leave the wire in place as you're pulling the sheath back and taking your picture. And that's my guy, Big Ben, not, not Tom Brady. Uh, and then lastly, I'll leave you with this, is, is our bladder sign. So if you have, if, if you are concerned for uh, injury of an artery, and is bleeding into the retroperitoneal space, take a look at the, at the bladder uh, full of contrast. It'll be shifted uh, if it's significant, and that's what we saw in this patient here. So that's it.